Hello, and welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about elements of the scriptures that help them become more real to us because we believe that helps us apply them to our lives more, and we need to draw more power out of the scriptures. I'm your host, Kerry Mulstein, and I'm so happy to have with me today my, my friend and colleague, Brad Wilcox. Welcome, Brad. Thank you, Kerry. I'm so excited to be with you again. I love what you're doing. I love the deep dives you're taking. It's just fantastic. Uh, well, that's kind of you. Thank you very much. So our audience will be, if they've been with us for a while, will be familiar with Brad. This is not the first time he's been on uh, the podcast with us, but uh, let's give you a, a short introduction. You've taught at uh, BYU for a long time, first of all, in the School of Education, and then for the last quite a while, uh, we're very happy that we were able to bring you over to, to be with us in religious education. And uh, one of our more popular teachers, uh, teaching lots and lots of students. Uh, also, you've, you have been second and now first counselor in the General Young Men's Presidency. And I, I that's probably for about three years now. I can't remember how long yeah, is that. Yeah, since 2020. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that that was an odd time, wasn't it? A good old 2020. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, t- tell us a little bit more about yourself, Brad. Well, I, I uh, served my mission in Chile. And then had the rare opportunity to be called as a mission president back in the same country. Not the same mission, but the same country. And that was an absolute joy. My wife served in Guatemala, so she had she had Spanish as well. So we hit the ground running in Chile, and we just loved it. Loved that country, loved the saints there, loved the missionaries that we were able to work with, and we're still in touch with so many of them. And if any of them are listening to this podcast, then I'm going to say, Good for you. You're you're <laughs> doing great. I'll give him a little pat on the head for still for staying strong and for uh, studying their scriptures. Wonderful. And that is, and maybe I'll just uh, kind of take a break from what we were talking about for a second to say that's what we hope happens from this podcast. I try and remember to say this frequently. We hope this doesn't become a replacement for your scriptures, but rather this becomes something that uh, gets you back into the scriptures. We want you to be studying the scriptures and that we're just an aid and a supplement and and uh, something that helps us catch even more fire in studying the scriptures. So I'm there with you on are, that. Right yeah. there. There's the scriptures right there. So I just wanted to let you know that we're already, uh, as we're just starting this, we're already about halfway full on our church history tour. So I want to invite you to register with us. Uh, we're going to go to all the cool church history sites. I'm going to be directing it. My wife helps me run this. She's really good at that. Um, we're going to have a focus on Joseph Smith as a translator, but also a focus on these new places that the church has just acquired, the, uh, the Curlin Temple, the Red Brick Store, the Mansion House. Uh, and there's a real Book of Abraham connection with all of those things, plus the newly built, most of you have probably not been to the, the Joseph Smith home in Kirtland, where the J- Book of Abraham was largely translated. I helped uh, with some of the, the preparations for that. So we're going to have a fantastic focus. It's always just a small group where you get a lot of individualized attention, a lot of individualized time, morning, night, and uh, day, whatever. Uh, so we'd love for you to come with us. Please email me at thescriptionsareal at gmail.com. That's the scriptures are real at gmail.com. That's how you can find out more information and, and express your interest. And we can give you all, all the information that you need. So we would love for you to come. This is going to be fantastic, kind of historic, since this will be so soon after we acquired these new sites. I am so excited about it. We hope you'll join. Today, we're covering Jacob 5 through 7. And uh, what we can talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. Uh, where, where would you like us to go? Well, Carrie, I think these are the the chapters that answer the question, is the Old Testament God different from the New Testament God? Mm. I can't believe how many times I've heard that. Yeah, me too. Uh, through my life. That peeve and, of mine. Yeah, and yeah. even from Latter-day Saints who know better. We know that the Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. We know the Lord is the Lord. And uh, and so it's it's they they usually are saying that because they're not familiar enough with the scriptures to realize that the Old Testament God is not all justice and the New Testament God is not all mercy. Right. We see in the New Testament, Jesus is, we see examples of him getting a little uptight and upset at the money changers, at the hip, hypocrites. And uh, we also see in the Old Testament, his mercy, even in his justice, yeah. we see mercy. I mean, yeah, he flooded the earth. He killed off people. But if you look with an eternal perspective, you realize 
he was being very merciful to those people because they weren't playing well with others. Yeah. And he he needed to get them to the alternative high school in the spirit world. <laughs> That's right. Where they could make better choices. We even see his mercy for pre-mortal spirits that needed to come down to earth and were coming to an earth so wicked that they literally had no chance, no hope right. of having any kind of a positive life. So we see mercy, we see justice, we see it in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And whenever somebody asks me that question, I always say, let's read Jacob 5 together. Because Jacob 5 is the most beautiful example we have in the scriptures of God's mercy and his love and his, his you know, his long suffering. Yeah. That's that's being shown through the period of the Old Testament and the period of the New Testament, and even in our day today. So I just love that. Um, let's let's remind people that this is not something that Jacob is writing, but he's quoting an Old Testament prophet named Zenus. We don't know him from the Old Testament. We know him from the Book of Mormon, so we assume he was on the brass plates. And scholars have said that he probably lived after Abraham and before Isaiah. That's their best guess. Um, but he's quoting Zenos, and he's saying this isn't just about branches and fruit and trees and grafting and, and nurturing. It's about God. It's about the Lord. It's about Jesus. It's about his motivation, his engagement in our lives. We read about the scattering and gathering of Israel in many other places throughout the scriptures, but never do we see the passion that God exhibits, the passion that Christ exhibits here in this, in this scripture. So I love that we're looking at his motivation and his emotion. Elder Holland said something about this. Um, this was in a book called Heroes of the Book of Mormon and also in a conference talk that he gave in October of 2003. He says, um, there is much more here than simply the unraveling of convoluted Israelite history. Of greater significance in this allegory is the benevolent view of God that it provides. He is portrayed here as one who repeatedly, painstakingly, endlessly tries to save the work of his hands and in moments of greatest disappointment holds his head in his hands and weeps. This allegory is a declaration of the divine love of God and God's unceasing efforts. Again, in his conference talk, he said, what an indelible image of God's engagement in our lives. What anguish in a parent when his children do not choose him or the gospel he sent. How easy to love someone who so singularly loves us. Uh, and that's what I think we see here is that complete and total and relentless love. Uh, that's beautiful. I, I... I agree with you. I mean, we have so some of the, the other prophets that talk about the gathering of Israel a lot. We'll get Hosea a little bit, Isaiah a lot. And Isaiah will on occasion mention something about God's motive using, and, and often we miss it because they use phrases like chesed and so on. But I don't think there's anywhere uh, where it talks about the gathering of Israel where we get more about the motives of what God is doing uh, yeah. and, and his emotions behind what he's doing, right? It's a little bit like uh, Enoch's vision uh, about the uh, flood, uh, as you were mentioning earlier, and that's where we see God's feelings about that and his motives, and I think we see it here as well, and it's, it's as you say, it's wonderful. We, we know this is the most important cause on earth today, the most important work on earth today, but here we get to learn a little bit of why from God's point of view. Yes, and another thing that we need to look at before we dive into the actual chapter and that is a statement by Joseph Fielding Smith. He says, this parable in and of itself stamps the Book of Mormon with convincing truth. No mortal man without the inspiration of the Lord could have written it. I have a man in my ward whose mother joined the church because of Jacob 5. I oh, mean, really? the, very, the very chapter that most members of the church skip. 
And she joined the church because she said, ah, Joseph Smith could have made up about a family leaving Jerusalem. He could have made up a story about a family building a boat and getting to the Americas. But she says, there's no way Joseph Smith could have written this. How could he have guessed right about so many details about a subject that he knew nothing about? Amen. And that was that was a moment that was a turning point for her. And she ended up joining the church because of this chapter. Uh, I mean, even the fact that we're talking about a vineyard, if Joseph Smith were making it up, he would have said orchard. Yeah. That's the only thing he knew were yeah. orchards, fruit orchards. And he would never have known that anciently olive trees uh, were not called an orchard, but a vineyard. And just that word alone, as Joseph Fielding Smith says, stamps the Book of Mormon with convincing truth. Um, now, another thing that's that's kind of interesting is that before Jacob 5 in the Book of Mormon, we read about olives. We read about olive trees. After Jacob 5, nothing no more mention of olives or olive trees in the entire rest of the book. Now, that kind of consistency amid the complexity of the book is fascinating to me. Yeah. Because if Joseph Smith were writing it and he just had a thing about olive trees, then we would have seen them all the way through. But we don't. Olive trees go the way of cassette tapes. Olive <laughs> trees go the way of DVDs and CDs and landlines and all the other things that that fall away as people move on. And as these people move to the Americas, they weren't in an environment where there were olive trees. And so something that was so common in the Holy Land was not even there. And so they disappeared. Now, that tells me that the Book of Mormon has the texture of reality mm -hmm. and not the texture of fiction. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's I had not ever realized that before, but you're right. That's that's an interesting point. You uh, mean you, I've you, taught you, Kerry Milstein something? That's amazing. <laughs> I, no, no, but uh, that's that's fantastic. I, I, as you think about it, you know, Lehi is mentioning it and He's very familiar with all of us, and I think he's and just Nephi. read the and Nephi, and they've read the brass plates, and and then Jacob, who uh, I, w I would guess saw some olives when he was young, uh, but then n none of their descendants will have ever seen any olives. No, and so they stop writing about them. Well, as we dive into Jacob five, let's start at the beginning of Jacob four. And let's go yeah. to Jacob 4, 14, because this is where we read a little bit about why Jacob is including this allegory. Now, and, is allegory, it all right, uh, uh, Brad, if we even, I think verse 12 also is part of why he's including it. So is it right if we do verse 12 and 14? Sure. So, so say sure. whatever you're going to say, but when we read, if it's all right to do both, that would be great. No, I was just going to say that an allegory is a metaphor in mm -hmm. story form. So a metaphor is a comparison like her hair is a waterfall or his arm is a hammer. I mean, it's a comparison, but when you elongate that comparison into a story, then it becomes what's called an allegory. And he's giving this allegory in response to some things. Carrie, why don't you go through 12? All right. Uh, and, uh, and then I'll pick up 14. Yeah, and, and I'll say, I mean, Jacob's gathered the people together because he feels like there's some specific things he needs to teach them. And so this is Jacob after Nephi. He's got to teach them these things. And verse 12, he says, And now, beloved, marvel not that I tell you these things, for why not speak of the atonement of Christ and attain to a perfect knowledge of him as to attain to the knowledge of a resurrection and the world to come? And I think that's the question that launches him into the other questions that you're going to have us look at that launches him into the the allegory but i think it begins with this idea that well we we need to talk about christ and then now he's going to tell us why it is that we need to talk about christ beautiful beautiful in 14 he says the jews were a stiff-necked people that's proud unwilling mm -hmm. to bend and then later in the verse it says their blindness which blindness came from looking beyond the mark the target is on the wall the bullseye is jesus christ and they are been, they've been throwing darts at the opposite wall. 
They're looking beyond the mark. They're seeing only sacrifice, the law of Moses. They're not seeing Christ in any of this. And so he explaining that. And then in 15, halfway through the verse, he says, the Jews will reject the stone, footnote, cornerstone, upon which they might build and have a safe foundation. And he's and trying so, out some Isaiah imagery there. Exactly. And then look at 17. Another question. And now, my beloved, how is it possible that these, after having rejected the sure foundation, can ever build upon it, that it may become the head of their corner? In other words, if the Jews reject Jesus, if they miss the mark completely, and they don't build on that cornerstone, then what hope is there for them? Yeah. What hope is there for my cousin who struggles with the church? What hope is there for people who have known Jesus and have rejected him? What hope? And that's what Jacob 5 is all about. It's all about hope. Jacob 5 is talking about a, a, a Jesus that will not give up on people, even when those people give up on him. He will not give up on them. Amen. No. And, and I, I, I think if it's all right just to say, I think this is such an important topic, and it's it's so important to recognize this is the question Jacob is answering, because this hits home to us. You can look at the allegory as kind of this big, broad thing that's out there somewhere else, and maybe we start to identify with it as we think about, okay, what President Nelson's teaching us about gathering Israel. But it really hits home when, because I think almost everybody listening will know somebody that they care about that has known Jesus, has known the restored gospel, and is struggling with that now or has turned away from it now, and that we can ask this exact same question. How can they build upon this sure foundation when they've rejected it? And Jacob's allegory, well, Zenus's allegory that Jacob uh, shares with us is the answer to that. So I hope that helps us. This is where it gets real, right? And this is where these scriptures become yeah. real, because this is going to hit us where we live. Yes, and this is talking about hope, which is why Jacob says, why not speak about the atonement of Jesus Christ? Yeah. Because that's where we find the hope. Now, in the introduction, it says the tame and wild olive trees are in the likeness of Israel, the tame tree, and Gentiles, the olive tree. One of my favorite articles that I've ever found that covers this is one by Ralph E. Swiss, who was a religious educator, and he wrote an article called Tame and Wild Olive Trees. It was in Ensign, clear back in August of 88. And that has been one of my favorite articles ever written to try to explain some of these things. So as people are listening to us today and they're saying, well, where did they get that? Where did they get that? They may want to take a look at Brother Swiss's article because that's the one that has instructed and helped me as I've tried to understand this. But before we dive into the actual verses, Carrie, talk to us for a little bit about why olives? Why olive trees? What's so symbolic? What's the connection between olives, olive oil, olive trees, and Jesus's atonement? What a what a great question. So uh, I, I think there are a number of things we could talk about this for actually way too long. But uh, olives are, were kind of in in some ways a staple of life for ancient Israel, uh, starting with Abraham, right when Israel really begins. Uh, partially because they provide light, partially because they provide food, partially because they provide uh, the oil that uh, will. Uh, you can be used for healing, can be used for cooking, yes. all sorts of things, right? Medicine, so yes. soap, cleansing. I mean, yeah. all of these things that we recognize are offerings of Christ. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so, uh, but I think especially the process of creating olive oil becomes symbolic of Christ. And uh, we've talked about this. In fact, uh, if my audience wants to go back to when we talked about Gethsemane in the podcast uh, a year ago, uh, the gate Shemin means uh, the the oil press, and it's a place where they they uh, pressed. Jesus suffered in a place where they would press olives to make oil, and the process where you crush those olives and then you press them, and that incredible pressure brings out this pure 
virgin olive oil that does bring light, that does bring healing, that uh, that is symbolic of the Holy Ghost as well, but that brings so many things necessary for life. That symbolism is a potent, potent symbol of Christ and what he does for us. So yeah. I find the olive tree symbolic both of Israel, because it's how Israel gets by and comes to God, and it's symbolic of Christ, because it's how Christ makes it so that Israel can come to God. Beautiful response. Um, I think we also need to point out that it's an evergreen tree. Uh, you, you really can't kill it because the minute you cut an olive tree down, the roots will send forth new shoots. And that's why sometimes when you're over in Israel, they'll say, this tree was probably here when Jesus was here because they, they as, as tr branches will die or, or get taken away, then new shoots come forth from the same roots. So in a sense, it's an everlasting tree. And that also speaks of Jesus Christ. In when the trees are cultivated, I I never have have uh, been involved with the cultivation of olive trees. But my wife and I did a study abroad in Spain with some BYU students, and there were so many olive yeah. uh, groves there, olive vineyards there. And we talked to a man, and he said, "Yes, he said it takes about eight to ten years." before the tree will bear fruit. And then it takes about 80 years before the tree will come to its full crop and be bringing forth the full crop. Wow, that is remarkable. That means your dad planted the tree. Uh, I mean, your grandpa planted the tree, your dad nurtured it, and you're finally the one that's yeah. getting the benefit of it. And I think that tells us how long Jesus is willing to nurture us not just for eight years, not just for 10 years, but for 80 years, he will nurture us, trusting that we will bring forth good fruit. Uh, that's beautiful. And it also speaks of really this idea of uh, Israel uh, being linked together for forever, right? This is not, we don't just save ourselves. We are saving all of Israel, all generations of Israel. Yes. Let's go to uh, verse three. It says, O house of Israel, and like unto a tame olive tree, which a man took and nourished in his vineyard, the vineyard would be the world, and it began to decay. So we're starting here at the apostasy of ancient Israel. This, this allegory doesn't cover from the beginning of the world. It doesn't include Enoch. It doesn't include, uh, you know, it doesn't include Noah. It's coming now from Israel and the apostasy of the house of Israel. And so that's where it's starting. And he says, and it came to pass that the master of the vineyard went forth and he saw that his olive tree began to decay. And he said, I will prune it and dig about it and nourish it. Perhaps it may shoot forth young tender branches. We just talked about how olive trees do that and it perish not. And it came to pass that he pruned it and digged about it and nourished it according to his word. These efforts that are being made to help us learn and receive Christ's atonement. And then it says that there were some tender branches that came forth. Maybe that refers to those who listened to Jeremiah. Maybe that refers to those who listened to Lehi. A few little tender branches that came forth, but the main top thereof began to perish. It didn't stop this apostasy that was going to happen in the upper kingdom and in the lower kingdom. So in seven, it says, the master of the vineyard saw it, and he said unto his servant. Now, I've heard teachers talk about the master being God, the servant being Jesus, and they make some great points for that. We also can read this as the master being Jesus, the Lord of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the master being prophets. And I think or the that's servants, what, yeah. or the servants being the yeah. prophets. Yeah. And then... Uh, that's what Ralph Swiss, that's the direction he takes. And so I think we'll stick with that interpretation for today's reading. Um, as we get so you can find you can profit from both. Right? Oh, there's yes. something to, to profit from for both. So anyway, yeah, sorry, keep going. We can look at it both ways. But let's uh, look at the middle of seven. It says the branches from and let's pluck the branches from the wild olive tree, the Gentiles, and let's bring them in and graft them 
so that we can see if that will bring forth verse eight fruit. And then he says, number nine, I'm going to take these, which I have plucked off. I'm going to take the Israelites and I'm going to cast them into the fire. So in other words, Assyria comes in, they take northern Israel, the ones they don't kill, casting them into the fire, are taken away, and they are scattered among the northern countries. Okay, let's go down to 13. It says, these I will place in the nethermost part of my vineyard, but look at why he's doing it, middle of 13, that I may preserve unto myself the natural branches. He's not doing it so much to punish He's not doing it so right. much to, to slap hands and spank bottoms. He is doing it to preserve this natural branch, to preserve the house of Israel. So he's saying, hey, they haven't done too well together. Let's scatter them and see if they can't do a little better. And it's true. We don't always do well in, in big groups. You know, you grab all these valiant kids from all over the country and shove them in Provo at BYU and they won't even go across their apartment complex to minister to somebody they're assigned to. <laughs> but boy, you take that same kid and put him in South Carolina and put him with a good companion and he'll travel three hours to go minister. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes we don't always, you know, being all together doesn't pull out the best in us. And that's why he's saying, let's scatter them and see if they don't step up to the plate. Well, and I think there's another element there, if it's all right. I mean, yes. And this goes back to what you're saying at the very beginning, uh, the need to see mercy in the Old Testament, which I think if I'm faithful to the text, I teach mercy in the Old Testament more than just about anywhere else. And and But what I end up having to say, uh, it's in there, but you have to see it is that God is punishing them all the time, but it's always punishment with a purpose. He, he talks about that. This isn't punishment, as you said, just for the sake of punishment, even just for the sake of justice, and justice needs to be served. It always happens in a way that is designed to humble us so that we will come back to him so that we can partake of the joy that he wanted us to partake of. And so that's exactly what the scattering is, as, as you're saying. The, the point of it is to give Israel another chance to help them, to, to put them in the conditions necessary. Like you said, go to the alternative high school, right? So sometimes that's going to be, uh, when I talk about that with the flood and so on, I usually like sending them to their room so they can think about it. However it is, we, sometimes we just need to put people in a different situation so that they can uh, respond differently and come back. And that's what the scattering is about. It's a punishment with a purpose. And we're going to see that there are a lot of purposes to it, but primarily to humble Israel so that they'll re recognize they need God. And in the allegory, that's just matched by taking them and planting them elsewhere. It's educative. It's, yes. its purpose is education. Well, in 14, he says, the natural branches of the tame olive tree in the nethermost parts of my vineyard some in one and some in another. So yes, he's taken the tribes in the northern kingdom and, and dispersed the survivors throughout the northern countries, but he's also taken Lehi and Mulek, and he's taken them to the Americas. And look at 17. It says the wild olive branches had been grafted in. The Assyrians, they took other people other Gentiles that they had captured and scattered them throughout Israel. Yeah. And look at what it says in 17. It had sprung forth and begun to bear fruit. Oh my gosh, yeah. it was good. It says, middle of 18, the wild branches have brought forth tame fruit. Now think of the ones that were left in the Northern Kingdom and the capital of the Northern Kingdom was Samaria. And so they bring in Gentiles who marry with the Israelites and we get the good Samaritans. Yep. I mean, Jesus ends up saying these people are more sincere in their worship and in their belief and faith than some of the Jews who've been so steeped in tradition. And, yeah, yet and look Jews at the success he has with that Samaritan woman at the well and, wow. and, and that whole village, right? Yeah. And yet the Jews don't like the Samaritans because they have mixed with the Gentiles. And yet right here we see that that scattering and that mixing has actually brought forth good fruit. Now, it says, what's happened now to the natural branches that are uh, that were taken away? Look in 20, it says natural branches. And then in 21, it says he put them 
in the poorest spot in all the land of thy vineyard. Well, if the vineyard's the world, and in the ancient world, what would have been the poorest spot at that time? It would have been Assyria. I mean, this would have been Mordor full of orcs. <laughs> I mean, this <laughs> was an, a, a, just an incredibly ferocious, warring people. And he takes the Israelites up and scatters them among these people. And then we get the story of Jonah. Yeah. You know, give us a quick little uh, grandpa synopsis, veggie tale <laughs> synopsis yeah. of Jonah. Really yeah, I, I, that's what I thought of immediately when you said this. This is the don't send me there. I hate these people because of how bad they are and how much they cause us pain. That's the worst place I could go. And I don't want them to change. And I don't want to go there. And I don't want to help them because they're so terrible. <laughs> Yeah, and then Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. Yeah, and so he, Jonah gets sent to Nineveh, and he wants to see him destroyed, and instead they repent. Yeah, which so bugs the, him because he hated him so much. Yeah, but yeah. the scattering worked. Yeah, do you see the scattering worked yep. because they repented, and that's bringing forth. Look at the bottom of twenty-two. Behold, it hath brought forth much fruit, and then he says, "Now this other branch." I, I have planted in another another branch of the tree. And now he's talking about the southern kingdom that gets taken over by Babylon. And he says, I'm going to take them and put them in a spot of ground that was poorer than the first. Well, what could be worse than Assyria? Babylon. <laughs> and so Babylon comes over, takes over the Jews, destroys the temple. They take them over. And instead of separating them, they keep them together together. And the opposition works in their favor. They, this is where you get stories of Daniel in the lion's den, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, Esther, who saves her people. All these beautiful stories that are happening because of this, this scattering that he has brought about. Yeah. So now, and, look and I look forward to the day. I'll just say, I'm, I'm sure that there are more places they were scattered to where there are more stories. And God has said that, that that's true. I look forward to the day when we can find out even more about how well this is working and and what's going on with this uh, flourishing in different parts of the vineyard. Yeah. Look at all the books behind you. Look at all the <laughs> books behind me. Uh, yeah, we look forward to more books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. We'll take a look at twenty four. And here we talk about the the um here we talk about the the Americas. It says another branch, another testament also, which I have planted. And in 25 it says, in a good spot of ground yeah. in the Americas. And then as you continue in 25, it says, only a part of the tree hath brought forth tame fruit. Now we could think Nephites, or if we're thinking of a better generalization, it would be believers. Yeah. And it says the other part of the tree has brought forth wild fruit. We can think Lamanites, but if we're thinking a little broader, then we could say non-believers. And uh, even <laughs> there, we're seeing that that they were brought to a good place, of, a good piece of ground, a good spot in the vineyard, and yet we're seeing people who are making those poor choices. Yeah. Well, to, towards the end of what you were talking about, I, I mean, we see the Nephites and the Lamanites sometimes swapping who's righteous and who's not. Exactly. And then we see them intermixing and it doesn't matter who they were descended from. Some are choosing righteousness and some are not, which is what's happening with uh, Israel back home as well. Right. And that's why you're getting the 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 net, the, the trunk that has some good and some bad. Right. It's So we just keep seeing that happen everywhere. Over and over. All right, now at 28, Ralph Swiss says, this is talking about the time of Christ. So now we're up to the time of Christ. And it says, the Lord of the vineyard and the servant of the Lord of the vineyard did nourish all the fruit of the vineyard. So this is talking about Christ's atonement. He comes, performs the atonement, and he nourishes all the world, the entire world. And then the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Look at the bottom of 30. The tree whose natural branches had been broken off, the wild branches are grafted in, and behold, all sorts of fruit did cumber, not cucumber, cumber yeah. as in cumbersome. They did cumber the tree. So boy, after Christ's atonement, 
man, the gospel goes to the Gentiles and there's so many converts that are coming in and it begins to become a little unmanageable. And so down and, in and, church, and all sorts of uh, uh, degrees of faithfulness to the gospel among those Gentiles. And that's why we get the all sorts of fruit, right? Yes, all sorts of fruit. And then 32, we see that it have brought forth much fruit, but there is none of it which is good. I think this could refer to the great apostasy. Yeah. That there's there's none of it. Look down in 36 it says I know the roots are good. The roots of Christianity, the roots of truth, they are good. But 37, the wild branches have grown and overrun the roots. And so then it says, you know, 39, it's almost as if they're saying now let's go look at what's going on in the Americas. How are they faring? And it says, the nethermost parts of the vineyard, and it came to pass that they beheld that the fruit of the natural branches had become corrupt also. There had been an apostasy in the Americas as well. And in and, all the places where Israel oh, had been yeah. scattered, right? He, he goes to several places, and they've all had that apostasy. And that's where we see our weeping Lord in 41. It came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard wept and said unto his servant, what could I have done more for my vineyard? When you consider the cost of the atonement, when you consider the cost of Jesus' suffering, then listen to the question again. What could I have done more for my vineyard? There is no more he could have done. He did everything that he possibly could. And yet still down in 45, I think this one goes back to the images in the Americas. It says, and thou beheldest that a part thereof brought forth good fruit. We could say the Nephites or the believers and a part therefore brought forth wild fruit, the non-believers. And because I plucked not the branches thereof and cast them into the fire, because I didn't destroy the non-believers, then it says, behold, they have overcome the good branch and it hath withered away. Is there a better description of the end of the Book of Mormon hmm. than that? No. It has withered away. And then we see this loss that's felt by Jesus. It says in 46 at the bottom, it grieveth me that I should lose them. 47, have I slackened my hand? Have I not nourished it? No, he says, middle of 47, I have stretched forth mine hand almost all day long. And then at the bottom, who is it that has corrupted my vineyard? 48, the servant says, is it not the loftiness of thy vineyard? Is it the pride of thy vineyard? Yeah, which not sounds so Isaiah-like, right? I mean, this, this is, you can just sense the, the Near Eastern culture in this whole thing. Oh, yeah. And he says, have not the branches thereof overcome the roots which are good? And because the branches have overcome the roots thereof, behold, they grew faster than the strength of the roots. There's a quote that I have loved for years from Spencer W. Kimball. And I share this when I'm teaching this part in my class. I share this quote. It says, it seems that some Latter-day Saints among us have the same problem. They want bountiful harvests both spiritual and temporal, without developing the root system that will yield them. There are far too few who are willing to pay the price in discipline and work to cultivate hardy roots. So, yeah, I want good grades, but I don't want to come to class. And <laughs> I want a good job, but I don't want to graduate from college. And I want a good marriage. I want a good marriage but I don't want to give up my pornography. And I want good children who are going to stay strong and faithful, but I don't want to have family home evening and scripture study. Don't, don't tell me to do that. That's just way over the top. We have, or maybe to even I want to have a good, strong testimony, but I don't want to take charge of it and nourish it. Mm, mm, right on target. And in each case, we'll never have the fruits if we're not willing to cultivate the roots. It's just a truth across all of those examples that we gave. And I love President Kimball's words. 
Well, he says um, in 50, behold, the servant said unto the Lord of the vineyard, spare it a little longer. Get Joseph Smith down there. Oh, my gosh. That guy is amazing. You get Joseph Smith down there and you're going to see results. He is not going to fail. He's going to just he's going to recharge everything. So let's start the next dispensation. In 51, it says, Yea, I will spare it a little longer, for it grieveth me that I should lose the trees of my vineyard. 52, Wherefore, let us take of the branches of these which I have planted in the nethermost parts of my vineyard. Let's go gather Israel. Let's go get these special spirits that have been sent through this lineage through the centuries. Let's go get this believing blood. Let's go get these that have been foreordained to be part of the solution to the problem. Let's go wake up the sleeping giant and let's go do what President Nelson says is the most important work happening on the earth. Let's gather them and let's graft them into the tree. Let's bring them to a covenant relationship once again with the Lord. And, uh, and so that's what we do. That's what we're doing. Look at 62. It says, is, this is the last time that I shall prune my vineyard. Carrie, what's the name of the church? <laughs> the G Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is it, people. This is it. These are the latter days. This is the last dispensation. It says the first shall be last, the last shall be first. Now, there's several interpretations of this, but, you know, the Jews were the first to receive Christ, when he came to live with them in mortality, and they'll be the last, they'll be among the last who will enter a covenant relationship with him. And the last, the Gentiles, who had to wait for the Jews and the Israelites to have their opportunity, they will be among the first to gather into, or Israelites in Gentile countries will be among the first to gather in to the covenant relationship with Christ. And then in that covenant relationship, 64, he says he will dig, he will prune, he will dung. Again, President Kimball says digging can be meant, can mean changing environments, pruning, painful trials, dunging, that doesn't sound too fun, dunging, yeah. nurturing. So does he change our environments? Does he scatter us about? Does he take kids that have grown up in the same town their whole lives and then send them across the globe on a mission? Does he give us painful trials? Does he allow for painful trials so that we can learn from those trials? Does he nurture us with the good word of God? Yes, he does. And uh, and then according to, to uh, you know, if as we read this, we, we can start seeing our own day in this allegory, the last days. Look at 70. It says, It came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard sent his servant, and the servant went and did as the Lord had commanded him, and brought other servants, and they were few. Now, when I do this with my class, and I realize that this is not uh, uh, the only interpretation of this scripture, but I always read it like this. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard sent his servant, Thomas S. Monson, and the servant went and did as the Lord had commanded him and lowered the mission age and brought other servants, and they were few. <laughs> did everybody go that should have gone? No. Does everybody go now that should go? Well, our numbers are increasing dramatically of missionaries, even though our pool of potential missionaries has not grown. But the number of missionaries is growing. It's beautiful to see. And these missionaries are realizing that as few as they are, Look at 72, the Lord of the vineyard labored also with them. I don't know a missionary who serves that can't pinpoint times in their mission when they know the Lord has labored with them. Amen. And 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 as I read that, I, I have to think back to Nephi's vision where he says that the the saints of God are fewer, but, but are few, but they are armed with the power of God in great glory. Right, and and I'm I'm with you as uh, missionaries, and also everyone. I mean, every single person listening here is called to gather Israel in some way, 
And, uh, and when you're busy serving with that, you feel God is with you. You just feel like, oh, you'll, you'll do something and later it, something, you know, you'll learn something like, oh, I didn't realize I was inspired when I did that, right? But, but you come to recognize God is laboring with us in all the different ways that we are trying to gather Israel. So missionaries, uh, everyone who's doing anything on either side of the veil to help someone make and keep covenants right, God is so involved in this work. Yes, living the gospel, caring for those in need, inviting others to receive the gospel, uniting families for eternity. This is God's work of salvation and exaltation, and it's all essential in the gathering of Israel. And it's having results. Look at 73. The natural branches began to grow and thrive exceedingly. 74. They labored with all diligence and it, the Lord of the vineyard, bottom of 74, has preserved unto himself the natural fruit, which was most precious unto him from the beginning. Why is Israel so important to him? Not because they're better than anybody else, but because they are the workers. They are the servants. They are the oxen under the baptismal font. They are the ones who are willing to do the work to gather all of God's children, to give every child of God that is so beloved the opportunity to come and to return to him. So it's not that this is a chosen people because they will rule over everyone, but a chosen people who will serve everyone, a chosen people who are trusted to offer the opportunity to return to God to each one of his children. Amen. Amen. And maybe one way we can think of that is that th this is a chosen people who have chosen to covenant with God and and do his work, right? That's that's what makes someone, and, and Nephi and uh, Jacob are actually really clear about this, that the, the people who are really of the house of Israel are the ones who have chosen to follow God and keep his covenant, that have come to Christ. Uh, that That's... Uh, that's what we need to be, are the people we're chosen, but we also can only fully be chosen if we've chosen God, to let you, him prevail in our life more than anything else. Thank you. I appreciate that. 76, we're up to the millennium. For a long time will I lay up the fruit of my vineyard unto mine own self. A long time, a thousand years. And that's what we're going to be doing is laying up fruit. We're going to be offering that opportunity to everyone who's ever lived on this earth. Uh, 77, then the evil fruit shall come again. The little season at the end of the millennium in which Satan will be loosed. And then finally, at the end of 77, the end of the story. And my vineyard will I cause to be burned with fire. Ah, <laughs> that, that doesn't sound like a happy ending, but it truly is because this isn't the fire that's talked about at the second coming, this is the celestialization of the world at the end of the millennium, when this world will literally become the celestial kingdom where we will dwell with God, with Jesus, with our families forever. This will be the celestial kingdom that has been celestialized by fire. Good and 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 that that's a potent image because it really it's getting out all impurity all all unholiness right and so whether and and you can apply allegories in lots of different ways and so on so whatever time period you end up applying it to and I think this is a really wonderful and powerful one and I'm sure there are people who have others that are also wonderful and powerful but either way we are talking about celestializing people and celestializing the world by. First of all, the 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 nourishing, and and I'll say just a second more about that in a second. But uh, the nourishing, but then the purging uh, and the purifying, right? Which is never an easy process for any of us, but uh, but a beautiful process because it makes us able to be with God because we are no there's no longer any unclean or unholy part of us, right? Yeah. And, and a necessary just, process. Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. And maybe I could just even, uh, and I think this speaks to part of what we were talking about earlier, if we just look at this uh, allegory as a whole, uh, 77 verses, you'll find 15 times you get the phrase, preserve the harvest unto myself or himself. Uh, you get the phrase, nourish 21 times in those 77 uh, verses. You get the phrases, 
digging and dunging and pruning and preserving a whole bunch more times. Uh, and that that leads to this idea, you know, what more could I have done for my vineyard? It really does paint the picture that the the Savior, the Father, the Savior, and the servants they call to work with them, but most especially the, the Father and the Son, are their whole goal is to nourish us in whatever way. And and you're right, like like pruning, probably not the most fun process. Necessary. Uh dunging. Yeah, well, that's fertilizing, right? But it, this, that, that may not be like the most pleasant either. Uh, but they are doing everything they can to bring all of us home to them. And it's it's so moving to me. Yes. Yes. Look at chapter 6, verse 4. And how merciful is our God unto us. For he remembereth the house of Israel, both roots and branches, and he stretches forth his hands unto them all the day long, and they are a stiff-necked, a proud, and a gainsaying, that means slow to believe, a gainsaying people. And he says, don't be that way. He says, look at five, cleave unto God as he cleaveth unto you. Mm -hmm. Look at seven, behold, after ye have been nourished by the good word of God all the day long, will ye bring forth evil fruit? that ye must be hewn down. No wonder he says in verse 12, oh, be wise, what can I say more? Oh, be wise, what can I say more? No, after all the FSYs, all the girls camps, all the young men encampments, all of the, the seminary classes, after the missions, after the education, after the callings, after all that we've been given, are we going to bring forth evil fruit? No. I think the majority of church members, the majority of these Latter-day Israelites, these covenant people, are going to come through like gangbusters, especially our youth, especially our young adults. They are simply remarkable. Mm -hmm. We're seeing upturns, not just from the time of COVID, because any statistic is up from COVID, <laughs> but... Comparing 2019 numbers to today's numbers, we're seeing more youth with temple recommends all over the world and using those recommends like never before in the history of the church. We see more on-time ordinations. We see more patriarchal blessings. We see more seminary attendance, more institute attendance. And as I mentioned earlier, the number of, of full-time missionaries is just going back up to numbers that we haven't seen since the lowered mission age, which created a bubble where there were two Age ages groups, yeah. that could be going at the same time. Yeah. We always knew that bubble would burst, but now we're seeing numbers that are approaching the numbers that we had at that time. These young people are coming through. Now, are we struggling with some? Yes, but not nearly as much as other Christian faiths are struggling with their youth. Look at this, uh, Carrie. I don't know if you saw this. This was in Christianity Today. It's by far the most read news source for most of Christians all over the world. And right on the cover story, it says, Mormons expect more of the next generation. Why don't we? And it's talking about our wonderful youth who are yeah. willing to go on missions, willing to pay tithing, willing to do family history and find names to take to the temple. They're willing to care. They're willing to serve. And they are, they're, they are wondering, why don't we expect more of our youth? Um, because the Latter-day Saints certainly are, and the youth are coming through. The youth are coming through. They did a study at BYU called the Family Foundation Study, and it was done during COVID to see how uh, COVID had affected religiosity. Now, nothing like a good plague to turn people to God, <laughs> because we did see religiosity increase in families and in individuals across the board. But in the study here, they looked at those who were not members of the church and 12% increased their family religious practices. Within the church, 62% yeah. 
increased their family religious practices. How did the youth do? Outside the church, 9% of youth increased their religious practices. And in the church, 31% of our youth increased their religious practices. You know, we were talking before we started recording about the impact that Come Follow Me has had on the church. Yeah. And it's really impressive to see people studying so faithfully. Yeah. Um, but listen to these stats. In January of 2020, now that was before COVID shut the world down, which happened in March, March 12th of 2020. Right. So in January of 2020, how many hits did the church website receive on Come Follow Me? 33 million. Wow. That's pretty impressive. Now, yeah. remember, they're hitting it multiple times in the month. Right. So in January, it was receiving 33 million hits. What happened the next January? 21. 170 million hits. Oh, wow. Wow. Now, that tells you that we are not going to just take all this effort that God has put into us and just let it slide. That tells you that the members of the church, by and large, are stepping up to the plate, and especially our youth, especially our young adults, they are knocking it out of the park. And I'm just so proud of them and grateful for them. Amen. You know, as, as you're talking, I have to think also about other things like, you know, you come follow me, but, but uh, home-centered, and uh, telling bishops and, and taking steps to make it possible, bishops focus on the youth, but all the, the focus on young adults as well and, and worldwide uh, things going on for them. And, and uh, uh, well, the, I know the young adult conferences, the FSYs, yeah. bring young adults in to mentor youth and the impact that's having. It's just wonderful. And, and when I think of phrases like nourishing and pruning and digging and dugging, that's it, right? Well, if if that's not if those things we just talked about aren't nourishing and and uh, pruning and digging and so on, I, I don't know what is, and it's working. Uh, and we're you know, seeing the fruit. We're yeah. seeing the fruit. And President Nelson and the things that he he teaches and the way he does it and the the uh, use of uh, the media to do it and so on, it's nourishing and it's working, right? It's a it's a wonderful time to be alive to see. The gathering of Israel, the way it was prophesied of in Jacob 5, and, and then Jacob explains in Jacob 6, to see that coming to pass, what a thrilling day to be alive. Yes, and it's it's so exciting to see what's happening because Jenna Erickson was telling me that they did a, a study, that many studies now are showing that benefit of religion, you know, that people who are religious— are showing benefits socially, spiritually. You know, they're seeing the benefits in their lives of maintaining faith in a world that's becoming more and more secular. And there's research that's showing that generally. But she said that some researchers in the church were saying, well, yeah, but they're measuring religiosity basically on one measure, and that's going to church. Hmm. And so they're saying, what about religiosity that's more private, that's not measured by going to church? And so they started replicating some of the studies and looking for what they called, seriously, the come follow me effect or the <laughs> home centered effect. Right. You know, where where is that fitting in? And they found out that the benefits that were shown in these earlier studies for religion in general are being increased by 50%. Oh, wow. If people are reading the scriptures at home, if they're focusing on prayers in the home, this home-centered focus, this taking responsibility for our own testimonies, this personal study and scripture family scripture study, it's paying off. So for every mom and dad that's listening, that's thinking, my kids don't listen to anything. I'm saying we read the scriptures and they sit there with their eyes closed and they they just sit there poking each other and they're not listening at all. I say they are. It's worth it. Hang in there. The consistency pays off. And we're seeing that in the research 
that it's showing that these efforts at the home level really are making a difference. Well, literally, thank God. Um, I, I, it's wonderful. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. So it's beautiful stuff. I, and that's, that is the gathering of Israel, right? We are seeing people uh, making choices to make and keep covenants and then going out and helping others to make and keep covenants. And that's the gathering that we're talking about. Uh, and, you know, as we talked about the scattering, one of the other things I've often thought about is that the beauty of the scattering, not only does it humble Israel, but it allows Israel, when they're gathered, to bring the whole world with them because they're scattered throughout the entire world. And we are seeing that happen. And if you look at what's happening in Africa today uh, and, and all sorts of things going on in the church, you see that the whole world is coming together in, in ways that were hard to imagine when I was a, a young man. Uh, but it is, it's again, thrilling. It really is thrilling. Jacob 5 is happening. Yeah. As, as my friend Carrie Milstein says, the scriptures are real. Yeah, that's right. That is exactly right. Well, well, amen. Thank you for, for that, uh, Brother Wilcox. We are Elder Wilcox or uh, President or Brother whatever Brad title or I whatever. Have this yeah, week. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we just, we're grateful for uh, everything you're, you're doing for us. And, but we're especially grateful for uh, the spirit that we felt as we visited here together. I know I have been invigorated by the spirit and uh, uh, it's been uh, full of hope, as you said. It really is full of hope. Well, I bear testimony, Carrie, I bear testimony that I am seeing the fruits. I'm seeing them worldwide. In the calling that I have right now, I have the opportunity to be out and uh, among the youth and the young adults of the church, and I am seeing the fruits. I am so grateful that they recognize the power of Jesus Christ in their lives. They are seeing that Jesus Christ is the strength of youth, and they are turning to him. And in their covenant relationships, they are accessing his grace. They're accessing his power, and it's making a difference in their lives. Yes, as you said, this is the hope. And yes, as Joseph Fielding Smith said, this is the stamp of authenticity on the Book of Mormon. There is no way, no way that a young, uneducated farm boy on the frontiers of, the, of, a, of a new country, there's no way that he could have just dreamt this up. This is evidence that we hold in our hand that Joseph Smith was exactly what he proclaimed himself to be, a prophet of God, and that our prophet today, President Nelson, and the brethren who work with him are prophets, seers, and revelators, and singularly focused on this gathering that was talked about by Zenos, that was taught by Jacob. And I'm so grateful that I got to a point in my life where I could see meaning in this chapter instead of skipping over it. When I was young, I had just skipped over it. But now, it's just one of the most beautiful chapters in the book for me. I just love it. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And with that, I mean, this has been so touching and, and moving to me. I, I want to extend to my audience as an invitation. We've been asked to encourage you to interact with uh, with others about the things you're learning on the podcast. And, and of course, we'd love you to make comments. Uh, if you're listening on a platform where there's not a way to make comments, you can jump over onto YouTube and make comments there. Or you can you can post on your own social media and make comments. or And you can like and rate and download and review. And we hope you'll do all those things. But uh, I'm going to suggest also that that you go find in person or on the phone or text, whatever is going to work for you. But the more in person, the better. Find a family member and find a friend that you can share some of the things that you felt and, and learned and that you're inspired to share 
uh, after you've uh, studied this and and listened to Brother Wilcox together, find at least a few people that you can reach out and share these things. And if you tell them about the podcast, all the better. But the most important part is to share, to testify, to help them see the, the feel the spirit that you felt and see that you have felt the spirit. Uh, I'm just encouraging you, interact online, but go and interact in person with a couple of people, uh, especially find a friend and a family member and and share this with them. Uh, it will bless them, and that's what we want, and it will make the scriptures real to them and, and uh, help them come to Christ as a result, and that's what we want. We also want to encourage you to listen next time. Uh, next week, we're going to have Josh Matson. On. He's oh, I gonna, love him. He is, he's great, isn't he? He really is great. And he's been on the podcast a number of times, so uh, hopefully everyone is, is just excited for that. He's going to talk to us about Enos uh, through the words of Mormon, and I think we're going to have a fantastic episode then. So we, we hope you'll join us then. So uh, just remember, the Lord loves you, and he's nourishing you. And uh, thank you again, Brother Wilcox. Thank you.